privilege this morning to have, uh, as I said, Reggie and Amanda here. And it's going to be great because Reggie also is going to bring our message for us this morning uh, about the Christian family. And so I am uh, really looking forward to hearing what uh, the Lord has to say from his word through Reggie this morning. And, uh, you know, I'll just give you a little bit of background about Reggie. And, and I just know him. I don't know if he, if he likes Reginald these days that he's getting ready to graduate from uh, Northwestern University of Northwestern at St. Paul. That's a mouthful. But, uh, but I just always have known him as Reggie. And so I first met Reggie, uh, I guess about, boy, it was right about the time we moved here. And uh, back in 2010... And uh, at the end of 2010, I think, or beginning of 2011, when uh, we met at a men's Bible study. And so we've been friends ever since, and I've always uh, enjoyed listening to his, and seeing his love for the Lord. And it, it just exudes from him, which is why he was, uh, it, it was such a blessing when he met Amanda, because She's perfect, and, uh, his, and, and her love for the Lord is the same way. It's just contagious, and so, they, uh, so the Lord brought them together, as I said, six years ago, and then blessed Reggie with the opportunity to go back to school and to finish his bachelor's degree, and he's currently at Northwestern. He's finishing his bachelor's and his master's <laughs> kind of all at the same time here in one fell swoop. And that is, uh, and he's going to get his, he's getting his degree in pastoral ministry, and which is what my degree was in seminary. And so, uh, so I know that he is enjoying that immensely as he's just absorbing uh, all of that Greek and Hebrew and everything else that comes with it and learning the Bible. And so, uh, so we're just glad that they're here today and, um, and on their anniversary, and this great opportunity for us to hear from you as you bring the Word of God. So, Reggie, if you'll come on up. Well, good morning, and thank you, Vic, for that wonderful introduction. Just reminds me how old I'm getting each and every day. But, you know, I, I don't want to think about it. You know, I just turned 39 some days ago, and uh, I tell my wife that I'll probably just start aging down next year. So next year I'll be 38. So that's just, I'm going to identify younger in as much as I can be, you know. We live in a culture now where they want to identify as anything. So, you know, anything goes. So... <laughs> But it is a pleasure, an honor, and a joy to be back at this wonderful church. Thank you guys for having us today. Thank you for allowing me to share the pulpit and to encourage you this morning. And so, in light of that, our text this morning is going to be from the book of Colossians. We're going to look at chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 21. So, feel free to open your Bibles to that passage, and as you're turning... Just a few introductory remarks. Again, I want to thank you for allowing us to be here today. Today we're going to talk about the Christian family. And it's been a wonderful day for all the aforementioned reasons that we heard about this morning. Our anniversary, the dedication of Natalie Grace Ellis, and a wonderful Ellis family that we've come to know for quite a long time now, and great friends of ours. So a real privilege to be here today. So if you have to think about summing up everything that happens today, this morning, it's about family. It's about what God has created since the beginning of time in Genesis. Today, we're going to talk about the Christian family. And there's a subtle distinction between just a normal family and a Christian family. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Today in our society... It is important that we recognize that family is one of the most important institutions on the face of the planet. Because today, our world has raged an assault against family. Nowadays, families are considered to be two fathers, two mothers, married in the same household. Not only that, but 
three mothers, three fathers. It's no longer isolated to one man and one woman as God intended. Now in the days, the state raises the child, not parents. Many of the schools have said it's our job to make sure that the children eat and sleep and get their needs met because parents, you're not fit to take care of your own children. Now, it has even gone as far as saying that children need to learn the evils of racism and all these other types of things that they're not even ready for. They are ready to indoctrinate and teach your children about the ways of the world rather than you teaching your own children. We live in a world where godless principles are reigning free. And so the important thing for us as Christians is to recognize that our family is important. Family is going to be the front lines to push back all these assaults against the world for the sake of our children, for the sake of our spouses, for the sake of what God has created. And to honor the institution that God created, we as Christians, we have to understand that the family is important. We need to understand then what the Christian family is, what the Christian family's purpose is, how are we to raise our children, and importantly, what our roles are. And so today, today is important. And we're going to look at what the Christian family is all about based upon our text this morning. In our text, there's going to be four things we're going to address. What the Christian family is, the purpose of the Christian family, something that I call their divine directives or their roles that God intended, and how they should raise their children. And so with me in Colossians 3, we're going to read our text in full so we get the fuller picture, and then we'll go through our points as each verse, as we point out each verse. So read with me, if you will. I'm going to be reading from Colossians 3, 16 through 21, and I'm going to read from the NASB, so it's going to read slightly different from whatever translation you have. And so the word of God says thusly, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Verse 18, Wives, be subject to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, so that they will not lose heart. Before we look at these principles, let us have a brief word of prayer. Pray with me, please. Our Father and I, God, thank you for this wonderful time where we get to open your word and talk about family. May your word take its root in our hearts. May we hear and evaluate what we hear today. And may we be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Bless our hearts this morning and bless this time as we spend, Lord, time understanding your word and your truth planted in our hearts, Lord, that we would bear fruit for the glory of Christ. And we thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, you have an outline, and there is four points we're going to make today. And we're going to look at the first point in your outline. And our first point today is the Christian family is a household that is devoted and committed to God's word. So the Christian family is a household that is devoted and committed to God's word. And we're going to base that on Colossians 3, the first part of verse 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Now in the way this reads, this is an imperative. This is a command. 
Paul is commanding the Christians at Colossae to let the word of Christ dwell richly within them. And so just to get a brief idea of what this means is the whole picture of dwelling here has to do with something that is settling, that abides within us, something that rem that is received internally, but it remains. It's an ongoing abiding presence within us. This particular term is only used five times in the New Testament in various passages. For example, in Romans 8, it talks about how God's spirit abides and dwells within us. That is the same word that is being used here as well. Uh, the way that God himself dwells with us in 2 Corinthians 6, Paul is saying here that the word of God, likewise, like the spirit of God, is to dwell within us. Also, in 2 Timothy, when Paul mentions the faith of Timothy's grandmother and mother, how the faith that dwelt within them abides now in Timothy, the same thing then applies to the word of God dwelling in us as well. And so the picture we get here is that God's word is to be internalized inside of us. Now we know God's word exists externally because we can read it each day. So the idea here is to take God's word and ingest it, put it in us, let it remain in us. And so this is more than just an internal reading, but we abide in it. It takes over in us. It is part of who we are. And by the fact that you have this adverb here richly, it spells that the word of God is to abide in us and to dwell in us, but it is to be abundant, rich, wealth, very much abundantly. Consider then for a moment, if I could, that our bodies are composed mostly of water. That's what blood is composed of. We are abundant in that regard. And so the same way our bodies are abundant in water, the word of God is to be abundant in us. It's almost like if someone were to prick us, we'd bleed scripture. It has that illustration or that allusion to us. And so it speaks to our entire being in that regard. So what does that mean for the Christian family then? How we can apply this is that the Christian family has at the basis of what they believe as their core values, principles, and ethics is the word of God. It is families who practice and raise their children, their values, and everything that they do, they base it everything on a word of God. That's what they're all about at the forefront of their home. They're that, they're that strange couple that always wants to know that you know that Jesus loves them every time these kids go to their house or somebody visits they always got to talk about Jesus they've got crosses on the wall they've got Bibles everywhere they're all about Jesus it's that family that is so much in love with Jesus that they want people to know it and everything that they do especially in the way they raise their children that's the Christian family it is these families that raise their children to be respectful and most importantly to fear the Lord to fear the Lord many families of the earth will, can raise their children to be really good men and women to be good in as far as a moral sense and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that they can teach their families many good things but it is a Christian family that raises their children to glorify God and to fear him. So that separates normal families where they have kids, they've got, you know, they can do all the right stuff, but it won't be for God's glory and it won't be to the end by which we fulfill our purposes in the Lord. There's a subtle difference there. You can almost think about it this way. Families can raise their children to be good moral citizens of society or not. They don't have to raise them at all. They can raise them in other types of ways. But families, Christian families, raise them according to what the Bible commands them to do so. So, with that then, when we think about the Christian family, the Christian family is a family where the word of God is abundant in their belief system. It is part of who they are. 
Families that believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and they practice that as a daily way of life, that is who they are. They demonstrate that in the way they love one another, how, wife, how husband and wife interact with one another, their love for one another, how they raise their children, the principles that they have, and the values they hold. They're not worldly values. They raise their children to fear the Lord. They love each other in the way that God has told them and commanded them to do so. And we'll talk a little bit more about the rules when we get there. But a Christian family is a family that trusts the Lord, that has as their central belief system the core teachings of the scriptures. They are a family that prays together, that worships together, that sings together, that comes to church together. Families that have as their banner, our household will fear the Lord. That is what we're about here. And there is no exceptions to that. And they're not afraid to show that. It's their banner on the front of their house. So this is the Christian family. With that, we're going to now move to our second point. The second point in our outline is going to look at the purpose of the Christian family. And the purpose is this. The Christian family's purpose is to glorify God by wise daily living, accountability, and worship. And we get this from the latter half of 16 and 17, and we're going to sort of combine this as we understand it. But just out of reference, let's look at the verse again. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And so again, your second point, the Christian's family's purpose is to glorify God by wise daily living, accountability, and worship. Following the command to let God's word richly dwell in us, in all wisdom we are to be teaching and admonishing one another. The outlook here is being expressing this through worship. Worship, based upon this passage, starts in the heart. It doesn't start here at church. It starts in the heart. It starts when you get up in the morning and you thank God for letting you see another day. It continues as you go about your day and you meditate on the word of God. When you come to church, your worship should collimate. You don't start worshiping here. You continue. It's a party. And you keep it on going. Worship and true worship of God starts here and continues outwardly. Even when there is no music, the music comes from your heart, not from the piano. It starts here. And so for us as Christians, worship is a matter of the heart being full of God's glory, his grace, and his word. If we understand God's word, we understand who he is and who we are, we can't help but worship who God really is. Every day we recognize that we are sinners who continually break the commandments of God, and yet God in his grace, rich in mercy, sends his grace out towards us through Jesus Christ our Savior, who died for us in our place, reconciling us to God. That is cause for rejoicing, knowing that when we repent of our sins, put our faith in him, he gives us a new heart. He gives us a new spirit. We are made right with God, and we can rejoice that we have a great and wonderful right standing with our relationship with God our Savior. It is because he is merciful, and we thank him for that. And for the Christian family, the gospel is at the heart of everything that they do. They recognize this truth in the way that they live. And ultimately, their purpose is to glorify God in everything that they do, in the way they worship, in the way they approach things. Worship is the chief end by which we do all things. As a matter of fact, a reform document known as the Westminster Catechism states, question number one, that what 
is man's ultimate purpose? What is the chief reason for even existing? And a short answer is to give glory to God, to give glory to God, and to fully enjoy him forever, to enjoy God and bring glory to him. That is our life purpose, to glorify God and to fully enjoy him forever. If we're not doing that, that's not, we're not doing our life purpose. We're living a purple purposefulest life or futile life as Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes vanity of vanities but here's the one truth that lasts forever fear the Lord and serve him that lasts forever that is your life purpose that is our family's life purpose to live for the glory of God so the Christian family. Their ultimate purpose is to glorify God in a family through worship. That can be through a time of family worship and devotion. Maybe you have a maybe you sit down every week or every night and you read scripture together. You pray together and you just have a time of worship together. That's all well and good, and that's yet a form of how that takes. The ultimate form of how you glorify God is how you live. So it's how do you conduct your family throughout the time, the rest of that time, not just when you're here at church, but when you go home, when you go to work, when you go to school, all of these things. We live to glorify God. All of it starts in a home. If children are immersed in worship, of, if children are immersed in worship with God at home, guess what? They're going to worship God here. If they see mom and dad loving each other, then when they get older, they will have a marriage where they can model that as well. Whatever happens in the home is going to be reflected in the way the children develop much later on. If families keep each other accountable for how they live at home, that's going to be reflected here. The thing is, what we believe has to be reflected in the way we live in our families and our household. What is going to be present is evident, and what is not present is also going to be evident. Case in point, if children grow up, see mom and dad take God seriously, there is a high, wonderful probability that they will take their faith seriously as well. One of the most central reasons why many millennials do not go to church today is because mom and dad didn't do their jobs. Mom and dad just say, well, you know, church is good, but it bear no fruit. There is no seriousness to God. They don't go to church. Or one, or, or one parent goes to church and the other one doesn't. Or maybe they both don't. So I guess this thing of faith isn't all that is what it cracks up to be. Why should I believe when they didn't? So if you model these types of things at home, it is likely that your children are going to see and they're going to take your example which is why we heard from Proverbs scripture this morning you need to train up the child in the way that they should go that's why this is so important and that's why at the heart of the Christian family it starts with us it starts with us recognizing that the word of God must be central to our homes obedience to the word of God is central to our homes our purpose as a family is to glorify God and we're going to do that in the way we raise children, the way husband and wife relate to one another, the way we teach the children, the way we model for the children, the way we discipline the children, and the things we teach them. It starts there. It starts under one roof. The Christian's family's purpose is to glorify God. That is what they do. So, and I know I'm moving rapid, rapid speed here, but let us now look at question or point number three. The Christian family demonstrates the law of God through their divine directives. The Christian family demonstrates the law of God through their divine directives. We've seen that a Christian family is a family that is devoted to the word of God to the practice of the Christian faith. 
we saw that their purpose is to glorify God. Now we're going to take a look at how they glorify God in their distinct roles. And the Bible is very clear about this. And just to note the context here is we're going to be talking about the home. We're not, not, we're not going to be talking necessarily about the church or work or school or those types of things. We're going to front and center the Christian home, your home, my home, others' home. So with that context then, I made mention here with this term divine directives. And what these are is that these are instructions and commands by which God has ordained throughout his scripture that we are to live by. And these basically come from Genesis 1, where God created us and he said, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth and fill it. And so from the very beginning, God has made us male and female. Just in case someone didn't hear me, male and female. You are not born male, male, female, female. You are not born to be something that you are not created to be. Creation tells us that, as well as the law. Nature tells us that. Electronics tells us that, male and female cords. It's very important we understand that because many believe today that family is composed of anything. You can change who you are. You can change who you desire to be. Well, I'm not a male. I'm actually a female. I'm a woman trapped in a man's body or vice versa. Not according to what God says in his word. And I know that is a sensitive subject for some, but the Bible is very clear. The Bible is very clear. And so when we talk about family, we have to understand that a family is male, female. As a result of male and female coming together, they will have a child or they will have children. That's the way this works. That's the way this works. So with that, though, the divine directive, what is normal is that God created male and female to come together to make a family and to spread out all across the earth. Now, sin has caused things to not be as they should be. Sin has cursed and plagued everything. Us, the world, the entire universe. Nothing works as it should be because man is depraved. Creation is depraved. This is one reason we have death. This is one reason why we have storms and calamity. Nothing works as it should. So all things need to be redeemed. Men need to be redeemed from sin, which is why Jesus Christ had to come to redeem us because we're too depraved to redeem ourselves. We can't do it. God's commands are so holy and perfect that we fall short of it. There is no one who does good. There is no one who is good. We have all astray. We have open throats that are graves. We slander our brother and our sister or our spouses. We hate one another. We murder with our thoughts. We commit lustful acts in our own mind and our own hearts. And before God, God says that the soul that sins shall die. Sin requires a sacrifice and a penalty. And this is why Jesus Christ is necessary. Those who repent of their sins and put their faith in Christ, God will remit our sin on him, and he will declare us righteous through Jesus Christ. We are saved and forgiven because of what he did on the cross, not for any other reason. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. We can't pretend to be something that we're not. We are only made right through Jesus Christ. And so redemption is necessary. And so the same thing is true when we think about these divine directives, how we play out our roles in the family. That is important to understand because even though for those of us who are Christians, we may be redeemed and we can obey God in these things, we don't do it perfectly because sin, sin still remains. So we have to be aware of that. But nonetheless, we have a role and function in a family. 
In Colossians, Paul addresses wives, husbands, and children, and fathers. This is a general pattern, again, as we said before. Let's take a look at what he says about the wives. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. We have to talk about this, because this is what the scripture says. So, get ready. I know this is a taboo word today. No one likes the word submit. Especially after last year, nobody likes the word submit. I, I, I understand that. But the Bible says it. We have, to, we have to talk about it. So here's what it means. The way it's used here, Paul is saying to the wives, you are to be subject to your husbands. It's passive. So they are to, the wives here are to take themselves and place themselves under the authority of, of their husbands. The same concept of this word is used in Romans 13 where it talks about let every one of you be subject to the government. It's used again in 1 Peter 5.5 5, when it talks about the young men be subject to your elders. It's used also in the same way when, he, Paul, when Peter talks about us being submissive to local rulers. Or in James 4, 7, when it talks about us being in subject to God, subjecting ourselves to God. And so in each one of these instances, the individual or the group is to place themselves under the leadership and authority of others, as this is God's divine directive within creation. And this is also a voluntary thing. The wife seeks and desires to do this. So it's not done with this grudging like, oh my gosh, I've got to do this kind of thing, really. She wants to do this. The way this speaks and the way the rest of Scripture has this, this is a voluntary submission that happens. It isn't done grudgingly. Yes, it is commanded as a norm, but it's also done voluntarily as well. So then, the wife is to place herself and recognize the authority of her husband as God has placed her in a position of a helper, a helpmeet, or a companion that is created to help him out on this earth. And this goes back again to creation. Adam was first created, and then God said that I will create a helper suitable for him. And then we have Eve, who is created to be his helper, his helpmeet, and man needs her. Man needs needs his companion she is necessary and God said that it was good and so wife your role in the home is to submit to your husband the primary leadership in the home is your husband just like the primary leadership in the church are the elders it means then that you support love and care for your husband it means you share in the decision making but the ultimate choice and direction of your family is determined by what your husband does. Therefore, trust him and let him lead and pray for him. Support him the best you can and respect him. And there are a number of numeral passages that you can turn to, like Ephesians 5, that explains that further in 1 Corinthians 7, that also fleshes this out a little bit more. And now we'll quickly turn to the husbands. So now we're on a spot. Verse 19 of Colossians 3 says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Notice that we get two commands. The wives only get one. So this means we have some listening to do husbands and fathers. Very important. Colossians says two things about us. Paul commands us to love our wives and do not be embittered with them. We're going to take care of the first part first. To love our wife is the same thing, the same meaning behind what is being used here is used in John 3.16 when God loves the world and he sent his son into the world to die for us. The same love that the Father has for the world and to those who would believe is the same love that we're called to have for our wives. It is a sacrificial 
love. It is not a self-love. It is a love of the will. It is a love that manifests itself through work. It is action. And the way it reads in John 3.16, God did something. Normally, when the word love is translated as a verb, it's not translated as an emotion or a noun or an adjective, meaning the way we should understand love, it's action. It is something we do, something we demonstrate, not necessarily something that we feel, meaning love has with it feet, arms, action. Husbands, to love our wives mean that we show her unconditional unrestrained desire of the will demonstrated by how you care for her no matter what good days bad days in sickness and in health when things aren't going so well when things are going well we are to love our wife unconditionally all the time no matter what because the love we have models Christ's love for his church and how much love does Christ have for his church? A lot. He doesn't stop loving his church. He will correct her when she's wrong, lovingly bring her back, but he will never cast her aside. He will never call her out and call and abuse her and all these other types of things. He loves her according to the truth, according to God's grace, according to God's glory. That's how we love our wives. We're to do this by leading well, loving well, and caring for her well. You, husband, are the leader, the head, of your, the head of your house, the head of your wife, like Christ is the head of the church. Leadership in a home is your primary responsibility. Your wife will certainly guide and feed the children spiritually, but your job is to lead your entire family spiritually in every way, not just spiritually. If you fail to do this, your family will suffer horribly and the effects will happen and they will be long-term. And if you want to see an example of that, well, read the police reports. Turn on the news. Look what happened last summer. So many things going on in our world because, well, kids didn't have good examples. Look at our prisons. How many of them didn't have good examples? And you can't put it necessarily all on them, but parents will learn from their children. So your examples matter. Fathers, even more so, your example is very important. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, Colossians also says here to husbands, don't be embittered with them. And so what this means then, what Colossians has in mind here is that something turns sour. In Revelation 11, a plague ha comes from heaven and it poisons the water, turning it to wormwood. Water that was at once drinkable and enjoyable becomes sour, distasteful, unpleasant, sour. We are not to become like this with our wives. We are not to become sour, bitter, harsh towards her at any time. We are to be patient towards her, be tender towards her, be affectionate and understanding towards her. Second Peter tells us that we husbands are to dwell, abide with our wives in an understanding way. We are to know our wife and to study her and do what we can to show her that we love her. We are not, we are not to berate, insult, talk down, or be harsh in our wife, whether in the way we talk or in our behavior. Absolutely not. Ephesians says that the one who loves his wife loves his own self. If you take care of yourself very much, how much more are you going to take care of your wife? You wouldn't, miss, you wouldn't abuse yourself, slap yourself, or do any of these types of things to yourself, men. If you wouldn't do that to yourself, don't do it to your wife. And God is watching, and he takes notice. So, challenge those words, if you will, but when it comes to prayer and a productive spiritual life, 
you're going to have some trouble. So, the word of caution there, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Don't be embittered towards them. Wives, lovingly submit and respect your husbands. Respect their leadership and their role in a home. Husbands, respect your role in a home and honor your wife and love her and thank her for all she does as well. Children will take notice and they will. And speaking of which, we're going to turn to the children. Verse 20, children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Children, obey your parents in everything as it is fitting in the Lord. Here the children are commanded to be obedient in the same way Abraham obeyed God. The winds and seas obeyed Jesus. The priests and acts obeyed the word of God. So children are to obey their parents in all things. Parents are the first and primary authorities of the home. They are the child's first educator, lawyer, teacher, law enforcement, judge, so on and so forth. The fifth commandment tells us that children are to honor their mother and their father, as this is again a divine principle ingrained in our universe. The parents set the mold and expectations of the home, and they will either shape their kid's life for the better or for the worse. What is fitting to God is that children obey their parents and do not turn from them. The idea is that they listen, heed their instructions, and obey them, just as we read again in Proverbs this morning in the verse. Train them up early. Children, obey your parents. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Even I know when they keep nagging you about it to clean your room, to do your homework, to don't do this, don't do that. There is a reason for it. There is a reason for it. Listen to what they say. Hear their words when they read the scripture and how seriously they take their faith. It's a good thing. They're instructed by God to raise you up in the ways of the Lord, as we see in Ephesians. So it's important. So listen to them. Obey them wonderfully, joyously. Don't do it grudgingly. I know that can be hard sometimes. I used to be a teenager, so I know. I'm talking about myself here as well. We all can probably relate to that. But the principle here, when children obey, wives submit, husbands lead, we have the divine directive being played out in a Christian family, and guess what happens? God is glorified when these things happen. God is glorified when these things happen. So husbands, love your wives. Don't be embittered towards them. Wives, be subject to your own husbands with loving respect. Husbands, lead your wives with grace. Lead your family with grace and tenderness and continue to be a priest for your family and pray for them. You set the tone. You set the tone. Love them. And with all of us, we all don't do this perfectly. I certainly am not the perfect husband. And I know my wife isn't perfect, although I tell her how much she is sometimes. I know she's not. And when situations arise in the home, when difficult situations happen, come together as a family. Husband and wife, have those difficult conversations. Talk. It's okay. Show each other grace when somebody does something wrong. Do as you would do here. Hey, brother, sister, we see something's wrong. Hey, we want to come alongside you. Galatians tells us that if you see a brother trapped into a transgression, go, you who are spiritual, go restore them. If we want to do that in the church, how much more should we do that in our own families? No matter if they're the children, no matter if it's us, the husband or the wife, we want to restore those fellowships. And I know in extreme situations, things happen. There is grace, there is wisdom that is applied to those situations when the time happens. But the general gist here is that the way families glorify God is by carrying out their divine directives. Husbands lead, 
wives submit, children obey. When the system works, when the family government works as it should, God is glorified and society takes notice. That is very important. That is very important. So we've seen then a Christian family. A Christian family is devoted to the word of God. A Christian family glorifies God in their purpose as their chief purpose. The Christian family demonstrates the law of God through their divine directives as they carry those things out in the way they live in their families. And so our last point this morning, the Christian family demonstrates the grace of God through the rearing of children. The grace of God through the rearing of children. Verse 21, Colossians 3:21. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose hearts. Now, in the verse here says fathers, but mind you, the principle of this verse can apply to both mothers and fathers. But the fathers, as I said before, are chiefly the authority of the home. They set the tone. They are the authority figures. So what you teach fathers is very important, which is why Paul addresses specifically the fathers here. But again, it's not isolated just to them. So I just want you to be aware of that. But for the family, how you raise your children are very important. It says there, do not exasperate them so that they will not lose hearts. How do you rule your homes? What standards do you have in your homes? Is it too high? Is it too low? Is it too overbearing? What do you expect of your children? Are they having a hard time? Why? What is something that you can do to help them? Sometimes children go on the wayside because mom and dad were too hard on them. We're too harsh with them. And that, that can certainly happen. And again, there's grace in that because most of the time mom and dad are trying to do the best they can. They don't always get it right. They don't always get it right. But the idea here then is to set standards that are reasonable, that are, no, that are not so overwhelming that there is no sense of satisfaction that the child does, that they try and they try, they can't ever make it. That is not what you want to do. It doesn't always mean that parents, you're going to agree or affirm everything that they do. You want to help them in whatever you can. You want to set a reasonable standard for your children, a godly standard, mind you, from the scriptures and what they do, so that when they achieve these things that you have set them out to do, you can praise them. Praise them when they get things right. Praise them when they did things right. If something needs to be corrected, do so. By all means, correct your children. We're not saying that. Scripture doesn't teach that. Correct your children when they're wrong. Absolutely. Love them. Discipline them accordingly. Yes. But don't make life so hard that living under your roof is nearly impossible. Don't do that. Now, if it's because... You raise them by biblical standards and they rebel against that? Now that's different because you're doing what the word of God tells you to do. But if they rebel against that, pray for them. Pray for them. Share the gospel with them and commit them to the Lord. But as long as they're in your house, your rules, your standards, but keep in mind, don't be overbearing, don't be too strong, but be loving and affirm, set good and reasonable standards so that they won't lose hearts. We don't want them discouraged so badly. All they have to do is just walk out the door and look how discouraging it's going to be. Look at the stuff that happens at school. It's discouraging enough. Let's be there to encourage them and to strengthen them. So mothers, fathers, don't exasperate your children so that they will not lose hearts. So so we begin to wrap up this morning. A quick summary. We have seen that a Christian family is a family that fears the Lord together. It is a family that has at the basis of their morals, principles, and their ethics, the word of God, the Holy Bible. 
The family's purpose is to glorify God in all they do. The Christian family lives out the law of God as they demonstrate their divine directives, their roles within the home. Wives are to respectfully submit to their husband's leadership and authority in the home as her head, while husbands are to love their wives through their leadership and compassion towards her, living with her in understanding. As the children obey joyfully their parents, when a family demonstrates their roles within the home, it is fitting and pleasing to God. It glorifies Him. Parents who set reasonable expectations for their children and affirm them will help them succeed as they get over, as they get older. You raise and rear your children in the instruction and fear of the Lord. That is one of the best things you can do. Parents who raise their children to be godly will do well and better than those who do not. Because remember, children are only, are only in your home a short period of time. The Psalms say that children are like warriors' bow arrows. You shoot them and they go out. Remember, you have to release your children to the world. If you want them to affect the world, raise them with godly standards so they can go out with the gospel and the power of Christ so that they can change lives and convert as many people to Christ as possible. That is the best thing you can do. That's how you leave a godly legacy. That is how you love people, how you love God, and leave a legacy. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. So, by way of application today, one of the commentators that I use had, I think, a very, very good way of taking everything we've said this morning and putting it in eight sound bites. And these will be very quick, they're not very long. But I thought this was really on par because they give us some things that we can actually do. Here's some things that you can take with you. Maybe some of these things you're already doing. Great, keep it up. Maybe there's some things that, you know what? That's how we can do this, how you can carry out your divine directives, how you can glorify God as a family, how you can live out your purpose, how you know that you are a Christian family. And so the, the Bible Believers Commentary by, uh, by William MacDonald, he expresses certain points about the Christian home. He says the Christian home is very important. It is the most important force in the Christian life. He notes eight points based on the text, and here's what he said. And he says, one should take note of the must, of the things that really need to be there. And so I'm going to give them all to you now. So here's what he says. First, there must be a family altar. There must be a family altar. And by that, he means there needs to be a gathering for family scripture, reading, and prayer. And again, you might already be doing that as a family. Keep it up. If you're not, try this. Figure out how that's going to work for your family. Every family's different. Every family's different. But the idea, there must be a family altar. Two, the father must have this place of authority in the home, and he must exercise it in love and wisdom. Notice what's absent. Not because I'm chief number one. This is my house. You're going to do what I tell you to do. Uh, no. It's your home and you're the leader, but you're not a tyrant. You're not a dictator. You are a servant leader who has to answer to Christ about how you loved your family and treated your wife. God's taking notice. So, fathers, we must have our place in the home of a we must exercise our place of authority in the home. Exercise it with love and wisdom. Love and wisdom. Three, the wife and mother should realize that her first responsibility to God and to the family is in the home. Wives and mothers, your primary responsibility is to your household, to your homes to your children, to your husbands. Use that 
and develop the wisdom that is needed there to deal with other situations. But God cares about the home. Your home is your first priority. Regardless of what your work says, regardless of what anybody else says, your family is your home. That is who you answer to. That's your responsibility. Four, the husband and wife should present a godly example to their children. They should be united on all matters, including the discipline of the children when necessary. Very important. Husband and wife be on the same page. Much like the elders have to be on the same page to get things done in the church, husband and wife, y'all got to be on the same page too. Y'all got to be on the same page. Don't you know? The family unit should be maintained. The family unit should be maintained. We do get busy, but let's make sure we are never too busy for family. Children need their parents, sometimes a lot. Don't let it all go to waste. I know we all get busy, guys. We're very busy people. Things got to get done. I know. Take time for family. Be together. Figure out how that's going to work in your family schedule. But you got to be together. Your children will remember that, oh, yeah, we had family time. We always did things as a family. Or they will say, eh, we didn't really do much as a family growing up. You know, they did their thing. We did ours. Which will have a better legacy? Family time or doing your own thing? Something to note. The family unit should be maintained. Six, with regard to discipline, three cardinal rules for punishment. And I, and I agree with these, he says. Never punish in anger. Never punish unjustly. Never punish without explaining the reason. And those of you who are parents, I'm sure that's uh, quite an experience for you. Probably one of the most difficult parts of your family is the discipline and how that goes about. Granted, the only discipline that I have to institute is disciplining a four-legged cat. So my discipline, you know, only goes so far. She seems to be a little headstrong, though, so, you know. Sitting in my chair, no, no. Good thing for a water bottle. That's, you know, if all discipline can be handled by just spraying with a water bottle, things would be pretty, pretty reasonable, wouldn't you think? But it doesn't always happen that way, right? Number seven. It is good for children to bear the yoke in their youth, working hard, learning hard work, bearing responsibility for the things that they do. To learn the discipline of work and accepting responsibility and the value of money. Let them learn early. Hard work, doing all the things that they can now so that they understand and appreciate the things that they have now. Because things cost and life is hard. We count our blessings. And number eight. Above all, he says, Christian parents should avoid being ambitious for their children in a cardinal worldly way, but should constantly hold them before them the service of our Lord as the most profitable way in which to spend their lives. In other words, you have really great and wonderful goals for your children, which is great, but the best thing that you can do is aspire for them to serve the Lord with their lives in whatever the capacity that they can be. It's not just going into the pastorate or being a deacon. It encompasses everything. Somehow we've always attributed doing the Lord's work is something done in the church. But again, and everything that you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the name of the glory of God. And everything you do, do to the glory of God. And whatever you do, teacher at a public school, first responder, police officer, corrections officer, chaplain, mother, wife, all of these things, all society, lawyer, senator, president, anything. The point is, do it for the glory and service of God. That is what you want for your children. And so, in all of these things, as in Colossae, 
who was dealing with the philosophy of the world. We are dealing with the philosophy of the day in our world, where we're being told, here's what family's about, here's what we need to do. We don't take our philosophies of life from the world. We take it from the scriptures. The book of Colossians has caused us to us to not have this mindset that's below, but to have a world have a mindset that is heavenly, seeking the things above, and not to hold to these worldly philosophies. And so the philosophy of Scripture is to do things God's way. That is what we need to do for our families. And for those of us who say that we're Christians, our household, we are a Christian household. Our constitution and banner is the word of God. We will show that in our behavior, the way we raise our children, the way we love one another, and the way we affect the world around us. Let us in our homes be those who say like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day the kind of household you want and this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord Jesus Christ. To the glory of his precious name, let us pray. Our Father and our God, help our families to fear you. Help our families to take as their banner your word. Help us to love our wives. Help our wives, Lord, to love and support and submit to their husbands. Help our children to obey their parents. Help us as a family to glorify you through the way we live and love one another so that indeed, Lord, we may affect this world for your glory and for the glory of Christ. Thank you for these truths. Help us to examine what we hear, hold fast to what is good, and indeed, Lord, to be obedient to your word. Thank you for the words this morning. Bless us this day, and thank you, Lord, for your grace to us this morning. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for watching today, and we hope you were abundantly blessed. Join us this Wednesday at 7 p.m. for Bible study on Facebook at facebook.com slash Legacy Bible Hutch. You can also access and subscribe to our messages on our YouTube channel to make sure you never miss a single one. If you'd like to help support the ministry of Legacy, you may give online at LegacyHutch.org or by texting the word GIVE and the amount to 620-220-3345. Or you can send your check or money order to Legacy Bible Church, P.O. Box 3091, Hutchinson, Kansas, 67504. All gifts are tax deductible. If you made a decision today to put your faith in Jesus Christ, we would love to know about it. Or if you just want to talk about your relationship with the Lord, call our church office at 620-314-9902 or send Pastor Victor an email at victor at legacyhutch.org. Thank you again for watching and have a blessed week.